Good, ap good afternoon. So, thank you. I, I, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of the great leaders who worked side by side with my mother when I was growing up as, as a young child. As an active, as my mom was an activist. She worked with the KDP that many of you know of, Josie Camacho and Victor Uno, Emil de Guzman, all here uh, worked with her. And it's been an honor for me to, to, as an adult, work with some of them as they continue to lead the struggle for social justice and economic justice and racial justice, including Josie and Victor and, and, and Emil and, and many others. So, and when I'm at events, when they're there, I like to take the opportunity to publicly apologize for how I acted <laughs> as a young boy. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, the Bonta children were, were well known, not in a great way back then. And, and so, I, as I like to put it, I, I had a lot of energy. Um, but, uh, but thank you for taking care of me. That's kind of the life of an activist family when you have children that are uh, part of the, the family's commitment. And, um, you know, they need to be taken care of, and it takes a community to take care of all of them. That, that was my experience growing up. I want to thank uh, Kim and, and Josie for their very kind introductions. I want to thank Paula for inviting me here to speak for your leadership throughout this country and in, in each of our communities where we, we need that leadership and that commitment and that, that fight so much. I also want to make a special uh, call out again of recognition and support for our Congress member, Mike Honda, for all of his tremendous leadership for our community for so long. Your inspiration. Thank you, Mike. And I also want to thank the Alameda County Chapter of Apala for all of its leadership and the Alameda Labor Council for its tremendous leadership. I I'm lucky to live in Alameda County where both of those tremendous organizations serve. And I'm proud to say that I believe we have one of the strongest labor movements, not just in the state of California, but in this country. And we have led so many times over so many years. So thank you for that leadership. I want to make a few comments. I want to share with you a little bit about my experience, which was inextricably tied to the labor movement, the, the immigrant experience, and the American dream, and the ongoing quest and struggle for API political empowerment. I was born in the Philippines. I was born in Quezon City, but born specifically in St. Luke's Hospital in Quezon City. My mother is an immigrant from the Philippines. She came here when she was 28 years old. I came here when I was two months old. My mom's from the Visayas, from, from Dumaguete. And she named me Robert Andres Bonta. Many of you know Andres Bonifacio, a Philippine national hero. She named me after him. And now as an adult, I'm very lucky to have a, a wonderful family, my wife Mia, who I met in an orientation program when we were 17 years old before college started on the East Coast, and I have three children. Raina's my oldest, Ileana's my middle child, and I have a son who I've named Andres to pass on that important legacy of, of struggle and, and the fight for, for justice. When I was a young boy, my parents raised me in the headquarters of the United Farm Workers of America movement. We lived in La Paz, in the Tatchby Mountains outside of Bakersfield. I was there for three years. And my parents worked directly with Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Philip Veracruz, Pete Velasco. Thank you. Thank you. Many of those great leaders we've all read about and heard about and, and rightfully admired. And for me, for my family, to be part of what I believe was one of the greatest peaceful social justice, racial justice, economic justice, and labor movements in the history, not just of California, but of this, of this country, it means a great deal to me. And I recently, like Friday, yesterday recently, visited La Paz uh, after not being there for, for decades. And I went there with my mother, who hadn't been there for decades, and my father, with my oldest daughter, who just finished doing a, a, an oral uh, history report about La Paz and the farm worker movement, and also my godfather, my but you know my my Nino, Jose Gomez, who was the executive assistant of Cesar Chavez at the time that I was there uh, during the during the UFW movement, and it, it was amazing to to revisit 
where I grew up, and to see the, the, the staying power of that ongoing struggle. Uh, President of the UFW, Arturo Rodriguez, personally gave us a tour for three hours, updated us on the work of the UFW, and, and the work continues of, of the United Farm Workers. They actually have a, a priority bill in the state legislature this year, SB 25. It's authored by um, the pro tem, Daryl Steinberg. And when I was there, they asked me to uh, carry it on the assembly floor. It's gonna be on the assembly side on, on, on Monday. And I was very proud and honored to be asked and I'm, I'll be doing that. But, but the work for justice in the fields and, and everywhere throughout the state continues. And I'm, I'm very proud to be part of that struggle. My father set up healthcare clinics for the United Farm Workers across the, the country, helping provide basic health care assets they didn't have. That was a time when the battles were for bathroom breaks and um, shade breaks and water breaks, simple things that we take for granted, but were oh so, so important to um, our, our laborers across the, the, the country. And he was recruited out of the UFW movement to do the same thing for the state of California. He set up health care clinics in rural areas, largely for refugee populations. And so we moved to California. My parents were both state workers, and they were SCIU 1000 members for over 50 years combined. So I grew up in a household not just that was steeped in activism, uh, but that was a union household. And when I went, when I went away to college, um, I went away on the, to the East Coast. I cleaned laundry rooms to help pay for college. I met my wife Mia, as I mentioned. I went, away to, I went to law school. And I wanted to help people who were hurt and scared and needed help uh, as an attorney. And I came back to, to California and I did that. And I was a deputy city attorney for, over, for about 10 years in the San Francisco City Attorney's Office, which is one of the most progressive city attorney's offices in, in this country, where we helped lead the battle for marriage equality um, and, and other very important issues. And there I was a member of a, a, of a public employee, of the Public Employees Union as well. And so um, it's sort of fitting that now that I'm in the State Assembly, I, I was uh, first elected to the Alameda Healthcare District Board on a, on a healthcare district. I was the Vice Mayor of Alameda and now very honored to be in the State Assembly. I'm the Chair of the PERS Committee, Public Employees Retirement Social Security Committee. And so we, we deal with everything related to public employees, uh, from pensions to, to health care to collective bargaining rights. I'm carrying a bill that will strengthen um, myers millis brown Act collective bargaining rights for workers across the state. Um, thank you. And, and, and very excited this year that I was able, as the chair of PERS, to, to carry the bill that memorialized and, and turned into law the contract between the state of California and SCIU 1000. After many years of, of, of give backs, of concessions, of, um, of personal leave days and furloughs and cuts to salary and benefits, this year we were able to provide a 4.5% increase to salary. We were able to provide an end to those furloughs and those personal leave days. We were able to provide some hope and, and some deserved, well-deserved um, compensation for all that had been given during the very difficult times that California went through. And this is an exciting time for, for the California legislature. Many of, the, of you who, who are from California or following California closely have seen the deep cuts to services that are so important to working families across the state, from cuts to education, cuts to health care, cuts to public safety services, cuts to social services, like CalWORKs and CalFresh, programs that people rely on. And this year, because of the work of many of you and of the labor movement across the state, we were able to do two things that were game changers. We passed Proposition 30, which was a, a tax on the wealthy, as well as a share tax increase that, that would be used to fund schools. And we were able to kill uh, a very ugly proposition that was anti-labor and anti-working people called Proposition 32. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, you know, people say in politics, as California goes, so goes the rest of the country. And I hope that's true. Uh, uh, because, you know, th those progressive taxes to support people who need the services that people need most, and to stand up for working people as we did when we killed Proposition 32, and to have a, a, a democratic supermajority in both houses, both the Assembly and the Senate, to have every statewide constitutional officer be a Democrat. And then to this year, 
to come together with the governor of both houses and reinvest for the first time in many years in all those programs that had been cut. This year, every single school district in the state of California will receive more money than last year. This year. And this year, we're doing two very exciting things that for me as a legislator, I, I think are, are, I'm very proud and honored to be a part of that are total game changers in, in the state of California. One is we're rolling out the Affordable Care Act. We're the first state in the country to do that. We're covering over a million more people who didn't have health care coverage, and we're, we're doing our part to help fulfill the promise to make sure that health care is a fundamental right that everyone deserves. Thank you. Thank you. We also did something very special with respect to public school finance. One of the biggest changes in decades. It's called the local control funding formula or the weighted student formula. And what it does is it drives more resources to schools where there are students in poverty, or students who are English learners, or students, students who are foster children. So we're driving resources to those students who need it the most, and that's the right thing to do, and I was proud to be part of, of that vote as well. Thank you. Um, I want to touch on a couple pieces of legislation that, that are important to me, uh, that I've either authored or co-authored or, or otherwise supported. One is Assembly Bill 123, one of the first bills that I introduced. Assembly Bill 123 requires that California's public schools teach, as part of the public school curriculum, the story of the Filipino-American contribution to the California farm worker labor movement. Yeah. To tell the story of Debbie Young. To tell the story of Philip Veracruz. To tell the story of the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee and the Delano Great Strike of 1965, which was very much a Filipino-inspired and Filipino-led movement. And to take nothing away from all of the tremendous partners that work together in the Latino community. Uh, the, 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 the great leaders we've always heard about, like Dolores Huerta and Cedar Chavez, are just deservingly um, seen as synonymous with the labor movement. But Filipino Americans also had an important contribution. And, it's, and, and one of the beauties of that movement to me was that it was a collaborative movement. That it was Latinos standing side by side with Filipino Americans to fight for justice and, and to work for a common goal. And, and that bill's important to me because I was a history major in college, and I learned that if, if it's not in the history books, it, it's not part of history, it's not going to be told. And, and although it happened, the story hasn't been told enough. And I want my children, when they open up a history book, and other children in California, when they open up a history book, to know of the tremendous leadership and courage and contributions that Filipino Americans showed so they can be proud of, of themselves and their community and the work that we're doing in the state of California. Um, I also have a bill called AB 817. It's a bill that would allow for up to five lawful permanent residents to serve as poll workers on election day in California. Why is that bill important? There's up to nearly three million voting citizens in the state of California who are not fully English proficient, who without language access and, and, and language services will not be able to exert one of the most fundamental rights that we have, the fundamental right to vote. And so this will, will provide that, that language access. And, and it's required by the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, and there's a shortage of poll workers with multilingual skills right now. So a very important bill. That bill has gotten through both houses. It's on the governor's desk. And uh, if any of you are interested in encouraging him to seriously consider signing it, uh, I, would, I would appreciate that. We're, all, we're also doing some very exciting things in, in California. California's been one of the most progressive states on many issues, and we're, we're also progressive with respect to our immigrant communities um, and our the valued undocumented members of our, of our community. We, in addition to AB 817 that I just mentioned, I helped author, co-author a joint resolution which called on President Obama and Congress to implement comprehensive immigration reform that has family unification and a pathway to citizenship. So we sent that message loud and clear from the state of California to the governor. We also have a, a bill that I supported this year which would allow our valued undocumented members of our community to have driver's licenses so they could drive to work and their families without fear of deportation or punishment. And I also supported, very proud to support the Trust Act this year. So, thank you. And, and Senator Member Amiano has shown great leadership in that area for a long time, and it will restrict deportation, deportation holds and stop unnecessary deportations. 
So a lot of great work coming out of California. And, and, and for me to be a newly elected assembly member is a, is a tremendous honor. I, I feel like I'm coming on the ground floor of, a, of, of the next golden age in the state of California. And I look forward to working with my colleagues to, to help make that happen. And one of the things that, that makes me so proud is, is Filipino Americans are the largest Asian American group in the state of California. For many years, Filipino Americans have been the second largest, but the fastest growing. And then this, this, just this year, the data has shown that we're, we're now the largest. And in the state of California, in the, in the legislature, that body that's supposed to represent the full diversity of the state, there's never, ever, until this year, been a Filipino American state legislator. There would be, there should have been two, three every year for years if the legislature simply represented the, the pro rata diversity of the state of California. And for the Filipino American community, I've seen so many tremendous firsts just in the recent years, from having the first Chief Justice of the state of California, Justice Tani Kantil Saka Uye, to having um, the first uh, Filipino American federal judge appointed in the history of the United States, Judge Lorna Schofield in New York, for those of you that are here from New York. And then it's, it's deeply humbling for me to be the first Filipino American state legislator in the history of California. And thank you. Thank you. And, and what makes me proud is that what it means for our community to, to have shattered that glass ceiling that had been around for far too long. And I promised myself and I ask uh, others to promise themselves that while I might be the first, I promise I won't be the last. That we continue to fill that pipeline and get more and more Filipino Americans step up into the California legislature. I want to just make a quick statement directly to, to all of our young leaders here. Um, public service is an honorable profession. Activism and fighting for work, working people is an honorable profession. It's something that I chose to do because of the values my parents passed on to me. And we don't have enough great, talented people doing that. And there's a lot of reasons why people have been turned off by politics and public service. But uh, I want to make sure that, that all, all of you, with reckless abandon, choose to serve the public and to serve your communities. I just want to uh, close. Thank you. I just want to close with a story. I have in my office in the Capitol a photo. It stands uh, over my desk. And I take all my meetings in that office. And everyone who comes into the office sees it. It's a photograph that many of you may have seen. It's from a lobby in Stockton in the 1920s, and it has a sign. And the sign has four simple words. And those words are, positively, no Filipinos allowed. Why do I have that in my office? It's, it's a reminder of the obstacles that the Filipino American and the Asian American community faced in, in the state of California and in this country. It's also a reminder of the progress that we've made up to now, because we have made progress, and we need to take stock of that and be proud of it. But it also is an ongoing reminder of the progress that we still need to make and the work that we need to do together. And I look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with all of you to fight in that ongoing struggle for justice. Thank you for having me.